Here we are. Hello, good morning. I am Ricardo Fawaga. I am the WOW Communications Officer and the World Council of Anthropological Associations uh, um, uh, Task for Chairs. So it is my pleasure to be with you today you know, and, in, uh, and introduce you to this very interesting you know, conversation of the U.S. pre-Congress uh, activity. Today we're going to talk about precarity in anthropology and I have three special guests with us. Uh, I would like to introduce Anna Ivasuk. She is a social anthropologist affiliated with the Center for Conflict Studies of the Philips University of Germany. Her research interests range from the anthropology of security, urban studies, and Romani studies. She recently obtained funding from the Gerda Henkel Foundation to carry out a comparative ethnography of neighborhood patrols and civilian defense groups in Germany and the Netherlands. We also have with us Vinicius Cauwe Ferreira. He's a postdoctoral researcher at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, where he pursues his research on academic circulations between India and Europe. His approach connects ethnography and along the red perspective in the understanding of, of contemporary structures of knowledge, production, and circulation. And with us, well, she will join us a little bit later, is Georgette Stoika. She's an associate professor at the Université de la Réunion. She has been a member of uh, EAS executive board from 2016 to two, uh, from 2020. She has been precarity and law officer and she worked close on this issue together with Sabine Strasser and Marija Ivancheva. Thank you for being here and for accepting our invitation to uh, talk about precarity. So, well, everyone knows, those who have been watching us or who knows the uh, uh, how uh, how we work, no. So I'm gonna, you know, give us all, give you all the space, and please, you know, everyone's welcome to send us our comments uh, on the social media, and we will be hopefully able to chat with everyone. Thank you both, Anna and Vinicius. Uh, thank you, uh, Ricardo, for uh, this uh, introduction, for organizing this uh, conversation as part of uh, this uh, series that uh, the IUI's uh, committee is organizing. Uh, I, I think this is a, an extremely uh, topic to be discussed right now. And uh, I mean, we are, we are very happy to be here. Um, Georgetta should, should do this introduction in the introductory uh, talk. So I'm just, I will raise some, uh, important issues uh, to, to start with. And um, then I will, I will just uh, pass the, 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 the voice to, to Anna. Uh, uh, the, the reason why we are, we are here today is because we just uh, founded a uh, task force at the WCEA, the World Council of Anthropological Associations, so it's a newly founded task force on precarity. Uh, this, uh, the, the idea of, of ah, Georgette is there, he's coming. <laughs> Hi, Georgetta. Sorry for being late. Yeah, no, no problem. Uh, I, I was just telling about the, 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 the creation of the task force. Uh, maybe you, you would like to, to start with that. Uh, Ricardo just introduced us. Claudio? Yes, I can. Thank you so much, uh, Vinicius. I, I have some uh, problems with my uh, internet connection for the moment. Uh, so once again, I apologize for, uh, for being late. Um, as uh, Vinicius said, uh, we have just uh, started uh, a precarity task force within the uh, WCAA. Uh, you might ask yourself, well, why do we need such a precarity task force? Well, uh, I suppose, and all the members that are implied uh, in the precarity task force think that we need a common ground for discussions. Uh, we know that the issue of academic precarity is, um, is very important during this, uh, these days. Uh, so, uh, the task force has been established in uh, 2021 
and uh, is uh, the outcome of a series of discussions and uh, a, a series of seminars, you might say, and initiatives that were developed in the context of uh, a series of seminars organized within IUS, WCAA, or within the uh, European Association of Social Anthropologists. Um, the main idea is that, uh, but we we have to join our forces and work together is that of creating an uh, observatory um, an observatory of academic precarity that can be seen as a platform for exchanges uh, uh, for conversations between um, uh, different let's say uh, national contexts regional or international contexts where we can speak about uh, precarity. Unfortunately, uh, we uh, we are assisting, we are uh, living and experiences uh, experiencing all of us a endless process of precarization. Uh, the idea is that to join synergies, to join the synergies between the different um, associations, different anthropological associations, and also between different collectives that are working, that have been worked in the past on the issue of precarity. Anna Ivasuk will uh, speak later about uh, Precantro Collective and all uh, the activities that um, that have been done. Uh, in the past, during the last four years, um, uh, I was member of EAS Executive Board and uh, as a precarious scholar by that time, I um, worked with Sabine Strasser and uh, also with um, uh, Maria Ivancheva on the issue of, uh, uh, of precarity. And um, we may speak, let's say, uh, about the first results um, of our work. Uh, the, the main result is the uh, precarity report. It's a little bit sad to, to call it uh, the precarity report. It's the, um, you, you may, if you Google uh, as a precarity report, uh, you can find uh, the entire um, uh, um, document that is available. So it's called the Anthropological Career in Europe, a complete report a report on the ASA membership survey. So it's um, uh, a work that was realized between Precantro and uh, EASA, and a uh, great part of EASA membership answered to uh, the questions of precarity, uh, academic precarity in uh, Europe. Uh, just to, to go back to uh, the precarity task force and that uh, was established within WCAA, the idea is to um, to speak uh, in terms of shared responsibilities and to define uh, strategies of those shared responsibilities between uh, the let's say the the professors the full professor but also the young scholars that are experiencing uh, uh, precarity unfortunately um, now we are speaking about academic uh, excellence in terms of mobility uh, that now it, it's a prerequisite to develop our uh, careers but those mobilities are realized on short terms and uh, the, the, this process of precarity is um, is uh, multiplying uh, endlessly, less, I might say. So we should join our forces, try to see what's happening, at, as I already said, at a national level, international level, and see what can be done. Uh, we know that in Europe we have the so-called European Charter for Researchers, and maybe we should try to work on the so-called code uh, of conduct that may be used. Um, at the level of, uh, let's say, the high-level institutions uh, in Europe, there's um, an association that is entitled the uh, IHE Initiative for Science in Europe, and they have recently published a paper uh, on precarity of academic uh, careers, and they organized the cycle of webinars, of webinars about precarity. Um, that uh, dealt with topics such as European funding, research as assessment practices, uh, research grant uh, evaluations. So um, 
much has to be done on the issue of precarity and uh, uh well we are here today to speak uh, let's say about this task force about what we can do what we can do together and what can be improved uh let's say at the level of uh, of practices uh thank you so much uh, i i can uh, answer later if there are questions or uh add other things thank you do you hear me yes yes Okay, thank you, Georgette. So who wants to continue or who wants to start a very strong discussion about precarity in academia? Oh, by the way, for those who are listening or seeing us, uh, we just published on the chat the re precarity report that Georgette was talking about. So you can download it. We actually, we also publish it or post it in different social media. So please take it, the, you know, give it a look. It is a great work that I have also the pleasure to read. So who wants to continue? Vinicius, Anna? So I guess I can go on and, and talk a little bit more about Precanthro and the work that has been done so far. Uh, my role in the task force is a Precanthro liaison because the work that I'm doing on, on precarity, I do already within Precanthro. And so I am kind of the, the, the the, the, the chain that links both initiatives um, and Cancer has been focusing much more at European level because it has arisen from the European Association of Social Anthropologists in 2016 during the conference in Milan. Um, I have been a member of Precantor since then and um, I can talk a little bit about the initiatives that we have undertaken and maybe to dig in already uh, the, the precarity and the extent of precarity, the kind of issues that we're facing with, I can already go a little bit more into details um, in the precarity report that Georgetta was mentioning at the beginning. So Precanthro has um, worked very closely together with the ASA uh, for this precarity report that was launched um, at the beginning of the year. Um, and uh, was written, um, and I mean, it, it was a, a quantitative analysis um, that my colleagues, Martin Fota, Maria Ivancheva, who was elected this year, uh, the president of the European Association of Social Anthropologists, and Raluca Pernes worked on uh, to analyze the data. The data was collected only among members of the European Association of Social Anthropologists, which already poses a couple of problems. Notably, the fact that um, the membership tends to fluctuate according to the years in which there is an EASA conference. So there are more members uh, on even years because that's when the, the conference takes place. Um, on the other hand, obviously, the fact, you know, being a member and paying membership fees already denotes a certain easiness of, of doing that. So uh, the most precarious segments of the anthropologists in Europe were lost in the sample. So we have to be aware of the fact that whatever results the precarity report mentions are actually worse when we take into account the non-members of the EASA. And the EASA, uh, the, the, precarity, the precarity report has um, two versions, one very extended and um, a summary. And let me just quote a couple of things from the summary of findings um, and recommendations that I thought were, were most important. So among the, uh, the respondents, 44% had a permanent contract and only one third were on permanent and full-time contracts. So, which means uh, really that two thirds of all the academic anthropologists in Europe are in some form of precarious employment. Uh, of course, there are differences uh, according to the country, uh, but also according to the gender. Um, men, for example, while they comprise 24% of doctoral students, they represent 42% of full professors in our sample. So there is definitely a gender imbalance when it comes to tenure track um, positions higher up in the hierarchies. 
Um, when it comes to the income streams, the results showed that only about 42%, 43% of respondents uh, reported being able to cover their living expenses only from the wages of one full-time job and the academic job being the one. And so uh, people often rely on sources and streams of income other than their wages to cover their monthly expenses. And very often, you know, they rely on partners or relatives, uh, which also, again, raises the point of the position of women. Um, in academia, and very often people depended on more than one employment contract. Um, only one in four anthropologists had money left at the end of the month, right? So the question that was posed in the questionnaire was uh, whether people will, were able to handle a major unexpected expense, and worryingly, um, about almost one third were not at all able to do so. Um, so that already gives a very grim picture about what it means to be precarious in, uh, as an anthropologist in academia today. Um, regarding mobility, uh, more than 50% of respondents had moved between countries in the five years before 2018, and almost 20% had changed countries three or more times, which again raises a whole um, a whole range of issues when it comes to stability, family projects, motherhood, parenthood, um, you know, things related to, to the kind of uh, family life that one might want to have as, at the same time as being um, an academic. Um, other things that were very significant, and this is where Brucanthro comes into, into the picture with the idea that was um, that was discussed in 2016 when when it was set up to kind of represent anthropologists' interests. Um, so when it comes to representation, only uh, half of the respondents, uh, so up to half of the respondents, do not feel that interests are sufficiently represented in their academic context. Right? And uh, we have a total of about 16% who reported that there was nobody who represented their interests, and uh, almost one fifth. Uh, were unaware of the presence of any representative bodies, right? So, and in many cases, they even saw the benevolent representatives as not really in a position to defend them adequately. Um, I will stop here with quoting from this report, but I think it really gives an idea about what it means to be a, a precarious anthropologist in Europe, right? Um, and so we can we can delve into the recommendations that the report uh, detailed later on, uh, if necessary. For now, let me just also continue by saying that Precanthro is continuing uh, continuing to lobby and advocacy for this kind of analysis to be done on a regular basis. And luckily, among the executive uh, committee of, of EASA, we have uh, partners and allies that we can work with. And um, we are hoping to get this kind of research done on a, on a regular basis. And we are looking for solutions to kind of extend this kind of, uh, of research at a global level to take the pulse regularly on what it means to be precarious and what needs to be done further. Um, another idea that is really important to mention is the fact that, um, you know, it's not only about precarity among anthropologists, precarity touches all the other academic disciplines, and we need to find allies among the other disciplines, and for this we are, um, we are lobbying so that there is research uh, about what kind of bodies we can uh, link with, connect with, and uh, you know, multiply the power that we have in order to be able to uh, affect the, to influence the policies uh, in in the um, in the field of education. I'll stop here for now and uh, give the floor over to Vinicius, maybe. Thank you, Anna. Vinicius. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you, thank you, Gerrit uh, and Anna, for uh, for this uh, introduction. Uh, uh, well, actually, I have been uh, my let's say my um, experience with precarity is uh, both at a personal level as a postdoc fellow. Now um, I've been uh, uh, trying to yeah, my, my, it's my turn to try to get a permanent position somewhere. Um, 
and also I've been working on the topic um, as a research topic and it happened by chance, completely by chance. Uh, I've been working on academic circulations. Uh, this is what my, my thesis is about. And uh, especially um, academic circulations of Indian scholars in Europe. And well, I, I, I was one of those uh, PhD students who uh, thought uh, he would find some uh, uh, well-established scholars everywhere and interview and meet them. And of course, I've, I, I found those people too, but I also found a lot of precarious colleagues, right? And so uh, this is a question I've been um, working on uh, since um, some years now. So, and of course, at this moment of my life, I'm, I'm a precarious <laughs> scholar too. Uh, I I prepared something. Okay, I, I will read some 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 yeah one page uh, so that I I I'm sure I can address some things that I I think they are are important here. Um, I, I I wanted to mention too that um, I have participated in some of these initiatives that Georgette mentioned uh, that EASA organized. Uh, um, at the EASA conferences. I also organized a workshop on precarity at the IUI's conference in Brazil. Jorvita attended that workshop too. So I think that creating this task force is part of a, an accumulation of discussion and initiatives uh, that have been uh, done uh, till now and are the, the institutionalization of this discussion at the, at the WCAA level, it's its really a good sign, I think. Uh, I just wanted to read something. Um, well, I, 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 I don't want to sound too uh, academic in this discussion, but I would like just to, to raise some theoretical slash political issues that I think we, 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 we could discuss and uh, I would invite people who are eventually watching uh, on YouTube to, to also to uh, dialogue on that. Uh, as, uh, as we all know, precarity has become not only a pervasive issue in contemporary academic life, but also a key concept in contemporary scholarly literature. Uh, I won't do the, the history of the term precarity. It's a it's not an, uh, a new term. It's not a new concept. It dates back to the fourth century at least. There is a lot of uh, so colleagues that have been discussed. This precarity comes from uh, precaire, the French, and um, it has to do with a specific kind of contract, labor contract, uh, in, the in the fourth century where a relation is bound through uh, a verbal agreement. It comes from prière uh, to uh, prayer. So uh, it's, it's, it's a no term, right? Uh, it, it has been used before in sociology and in history since the late 19th century. The first translation of the manifesto of the Communist Party in French used the term precarity to talk about laborers. Um, and uh, social, the sociology of family of labor in the 80s, they used the term precarity already. But in the last 10 years, we really, this became a kind of watchword uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, talk about contemporary growth. So we talk about precarious life, um, we talk about uh, precarious existence, it's very broad, right? Uh, and in the last five years, we have this uh, this lot, this vast and growing literature on precar academic precarity. It it really has uh, become a a research topic, let's say, on in anthropology, academic precarity as such. And then I think this is one of this uh, one of the tasks of the of this task force is to bring people together also who have been working on, on, on precarity, who have been writing on precarity, either from their own experiences 
which is a good part of this uh, this literature, uh, or uh, ethnographically, uh, right? It's it's of course this is uh, less common, but I think this uh, this is a a tendency now. Uh, I think that w w another question we, we should address is um, that academic precarity is has some spe specificities uh, which make it different from discussing precarity in general, right? We, we've been talking a lot about um, labor, uh, precarious labor, so the maquiladoras in the US, uh, the North African migrants in, in Europe, um, Uber drivers all over the world. But what does that mean to, to talk about academic precarity, high-skilled high precarity? I mean, uh, I think this is something that we should address too. Uh, and, uh, I mean, uh, not only in epistemological or, or conceptual terms, but also political, politically speaking. Since, um, as we all know, um, critical anthropology should allow us to forge better active understandings of the world, not simply socially relevant, but especially socially transformative, right? But and I think this is one of the tasks of this, uh, this task force, is to think about ways of being more and more critical and vocal when it comes to critically analyze our own professional field, the one we depend on to live, in the sense of making a living, of course, and vocalize its flaws, moral economies, institutional practices, and political choices that are made by colleagues and employers, right? Or not, I mean, not, uh, we, and we have to be aware that if, of the fact that we are not always talking about choices, as some, sometimes um, things happen in a very up-down way. Uh, head of departments, directors, they have to deal with fait accomplis, with this, of things that are decided uh, from an institutional point of view. Uh, and I think this is one very delicate, de delicate question uh, we, we, we have to discuss, right? When we are, as, an, as anthropologists, discussing precarity, not only in anthropology, but in academic life in, in general. Um, I, no wonder that the question, the discussion on precarity in anthropology seems to very often create a kind of divide between senior and young scholars in a very odd dynamic of mutual suspicion, let's say, right? On the one side, senior scholars say that they and their generation have experienced many difficulties as well, what, what's true, of course. And uh, on the other hand, so-called young, and I say young, what is a young scholar, right? What is the age we, we can be called young, right? Sometimes we are, <laughs> we are not that young anymore, but we are still young colleagues, right? Uh, and so uh, on, the, on the other hand, these so-called young colleagues feel that their anti-precarity agenda and worries about the future are dismissed or not taken seriously enough by those who occupy a permanent position. Of course, this is not always the case and uh, recent institutional uh, initiatives have been important to change this scenario. But academic precarity as a specific kind of precarious labor and life, as Anna said, is not only about labor, it's about life, motherhood, family, sexual life, sex life, everything, right? Is yet to better is yet to be better understood, discussed, and fought in more concerted initiatives between newcomers and senior scholars. Uh, 
And uh, to conclude, uh, I don't want to be too long, uh, I would like to stress a crucial issue that, in my view, has been missing in the current anthropological debate on precarity, especially academic precarity. And I think we, we, uh, that this task force as, a, uh, as a, a task force that composes a global institution, right, uh, has, to do, has to deal with. Uh, over the past five years, so we have this uh, growing literature on academic precarity, but in general, I have the feeling that uh, I have the sense that precarity has been framed through uh, some kind of theoretical and political lexicon of neoliberalism and globalization, which are, in their turn, often um, very Eurocentric in, in the way how we discuss academic precarity. And, and then I, I, I'm talking as a is a Brazilian by a Brazilian scholar who was trained in Brazil initially, then in France, and uh, worked on uh, these academic uh, circulations between India and France. Right. So my my my, my perspective is informed by these uh, by these uh, different locations, uh, and I, I'm saying that because precarity in this uh, huge literature. Uh, is, a, is seen as a kind of derivative of, very often, of diffusionist conceptions of globalization and capitalism as forms of existence that emanate from the North, right? So, of course, globalization, capitalism, it is, emanates from the North and affects the rest of the world. The problem is uh, this implies a twofold epistemological and political problem. On the one hand, it erases the colonial, post-colonial, and new colonial, not to mention not, not to mention the decolonial nature of academic precarity and neoliberalism. And on the other hand, and by extension, the current idea of and I, and I, 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 I say global academia uh, uh, in a uh, suspicious way because that describes that actually describes specific but yet universalized notions of a very of which are northern notions of something that is actually very diverse a very diverse international academic late landscape and this attitude obliterates uh, very i mean differences and different forms of precarity and precarization of academia in different parts of the world, I think. And I think this is something that uh, we have to discuss too, is how precarity is experienced, has different histories, and is experienced in different uh, parts of the world. But also, uh, the, concrete, uh, sorry, the concrete implication of that attitude is not only the lack of global dialogues between scholars based in different global locations, but also the failing understanding of a social phenomenon, academic precarity, as a both post-colonial and decolonial issue that intersects with mobility, as Anna mentioned again. Um, in, in my work on uh, Indian scholars, what I noticed, and this is something that many of, of these um, um, Southern scholars, in Europe, for example, they, 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 they mentioned is the fact that not only mobility is, a, is, is very good for precarity, mobility is as a form of precarization, right? No one is against mobility, right? Who can be against mobility? We are all for circulation of people and ideas, but we have to discuss how the idea, the very idea of mobility is appropriated by institutional practices and scientific policies in the creation of um, a huge mobile uh, labor force, hyper uh, qualified labor force that is just mobile and is moving uh, through uh, different uh, short term contracts, right? But also, 
what what I what I, I would like to stress is the fact that what we call globalization, transnationalism, uh, which which are which are these uh, big words we use all the time to talk about contemporary world, they have a colonial and post-colonial history. They rely on colonial and post-colonial imaginaries to uh, attract people from over the from all over the world for example in europe when we talk about europe so in in the in the case of indian scholars for example i, I don't I, I i i think i don't have to explain too much i mean how Indian intellectual history is connected with Europe and uh, especially the UK Academy, right? But and how the, the discourse on diversity now and the coloniality as well has been uh, used to uh, precarize uh, acad academia, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think, and uh, and finally to to to, to conclude, uh, I think. As a Brazilian scholar um, who is in Brazil now, I'm based in Brazil at this moment. I came back to Brazil after many years in, in, in France. Uh, I, I can see different kinds of precarization here going on, which are very different from Europe, for example. So yeah, just just uh, launching some questions, some issues. Uh, I think we could discuss, and uh, yeah, I, I hope I, I wasn't too long. No, thank you, Vinicius. I, 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 well, I think that everyone who's listening or viewing us are a little bit worried. But as a young scholar, yes, that, this is only for you know the videos. Well, I would like to you know make a couple of of points. Well, not from my experience. I don't want you to start you know crying or feeling sorry for me. But one of the many things that, for example, Anna, Georgetta, Vinicius was mentioning, it is that political conditions that mostly are or national or sometimes are regional. For example, the European Union has specific um, programs, you know, for you know, as you mentioned, for example, mobility. There's different grants, different uh, ways of going through the through the maze of of precarity at some point. But as you mentioned, Vinicius, we don't want to be moving all the time, you know, jumping from one country to another. You know, some people might like it, some other people don't, and especially because this is might be an uh, uh, you know very important to mention, and um, well, that has to do with the sexual life of academics, or well, actually people, is like some people would like to have a family. You know? So especially, you know, my my colleagues, uh, those who want to say like, well, yes, I want to be a mom, but you know, I have to wait, or the mm -hmm. structure where I would where I study, depending on the country, depending on different scholarships, is like I have to postpone that, or some other people has to do it. So different conditions are, you know, uh, like finally we're seeing academics as humans. You know, like yes, we like to have drinks, we like to eat fancy food sometimes, we like to have families, we like to have or spend time with our children or with our cats, right? Anna, do you have a cat? <laughs> so that's one of the things, and the, one of the other things that probably we're not, uh, 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 or something that I don't see very often, it is like the infrastructure we're talking about. I know that there's a lot of infrastructural turns lately in anthropology and the social sciences, but one of the many things that we are not seeing is, for example, the infrastructure that we have on the uh, or at our local universities. For example, it's not the same thing as studying in France, as studying in Mexico, or as studying in Brazil. You know, for uh, let me put you an example. Or in China, you know, we, we need books. You no. Know? We cannot find the books, and the pandemic, for example, make us, you know, find different ways of getting our literature from different places. Sometimes not legal, I know, but even in that illegality, you know, most of the literature was in English, for example. No, like we're even bad in our piracy practices in some countries, and I'm talking only for the for the Spanish context, you know, well, the Spanish Mexican context context because when we were trying to figure out like about 
Mexican bibliography, we couldn't find it. Oh, but guess what? We can find all the bibliography in some, you know, specific websites of everything produced by major, you know, English uh, uh, editorials or university presses. You know, like, it's not weird. It's like, what's going on with that? And that's part of the precarity, or as far as I understand it, you know, like it's part of the infrastructure. Like, even right now, I think the four of us, we come from different, like English is not our native language, or I'm wrong. So that's also part of it. You know, uh, Portuguese, Anna, your first language is what? German? R Romanian. Oh, there it goes. Also from the periphery. <laughs> oh, there it goes. And Georgette? Romanian. You're too Romanian? Yes. Oh, I thought that you were from Italy. Well, anyway, no, that's good. No, I, I moved from different countries for reasons of precarity. That's why. But I, I'm, I'm Romanian is my mother tongue. Oh, so you see, like we have two, none of us speak English, but now we are, you know, talking in English with everyone. So we technically we're using like lingua franca, you know, to understand each other. But anyway, that's another issue. And that's also part of the precarity. But my main point, and this is where I want to start the discussion, is like there are many issues going on, you know, and I'm very thankful that there's the report from EASE. Um, there are some other literature, for example, here in Mexico, we have the wonderful study of Luis Regadas, who wrote a very thick book about like why anthropologists don't have a job. So that's well, that's not the title, but I like to call it like is the millennium anthropologists. So it's a big, you know, effort, you know, statistical effort, a lot of, uh, of numbers trying to figure out like why, you know, there's no jobs. So of course, the conclusion and I agree with Liz that uh, the future is not very bright, but at least there are some points that we can, you know, took from it. And I know, for example, from the World Council of Anthropological Associations, Georgetta was there with me in Florianopolis. We discussed a little bit this big global uh, questionnaire about, you know, our own profession. And the things were not very bright either for for. for all of the national anthropologists, and we're talking about like 50 different countries. So what's next? Like we have issues about like po the political issues. We have uh, the infrastructural issues, you know, the intersectional issues that we need to fight. You know, that's racism, discrimination, you know, lack of funding, um, uh, lack of infrastructure of our own, uh, universities, lack of funding for doing field work, you know, lack of funding for doing our get togethers and academic gatherings, uh, language, and of course, mobility. So what's next in the agenda for, for our, for precarity? I don't know. I, I actually, I don't know. I, I like the topic. I myself consider myself also a precarious scholar, John scholars, I'm, I'm, I'm going to underline that again. <laughs> but the thing is like, what's next? We need more scholarships. I know that everyone here has a, probably one postdoc doing another one. I know people from the sciences who are doing, you know, two, three postdocs in different institutions, like Georgetta mentioned, you know, moving around Europe, you know, different projects. Of course, it's like a big learning curve but we want to be one place for once and for all. No, because for example, Anna and our little furry friend there, for example, you know, her cat, you know, it is also, well, and I also have cats, but for example, it is also an issue of moving around with our own pets. Don't get me wrong. I, I love, I love them, but you know, moving around with, family, pets, or non-humans, as you want to call them, you know, moving around, trying to figure out, you know, our daily everything. And as Georgetta mentioned, like in the report, you know, like one in four, I guess that in Latin America, probably one in six, you know, we'll have enough money at the end of the month. So what we can do. 
for what we can discuss. Jump in, jump in what you said about precari about uh, mobility and um, tying that into what Vinicius was talking about earlier on a little bit um, when he said that, you know, uh, um, sort of established scholars have had their share of difficulties, right? And I remember at the plenary discussion that we had in Milan in 2016, right after we, we uh, founded Precanthro, um, we brought this issue of mobility into discussion and um, a gentleman uh, with a certain age uh, stood up and said, I don't understand why you people complain so much about mobility. It's normal and it's lovely to be able to move around as a student. But what was not realized um, was the fact that, you know, we are not students anymore. Most of us are, you know, anywhere from mid 30s to mid 40s with children. Um, it is really not an issue of not wanting to move. It's an issue of everything that comes with it. And I would like to point out the fact that, you know, getting on the tenure track um, 10 years, 15 years ago was really not the same as it is right now. Right now, it really turned into a kind of lottery simply because of the neoliberal policies that made uh, one of the one of the indicators for excellence in among universities was the number of uh, of phd's produced therefore universities started producing phd's in industrial quantities which got stuck who got stuck in at postdoc level and this created a bottleneck and i remember a few years ago, I don't have the recent data, but a few years ago, for example, in Germany, there were only 11,000 um, tenure track positions for about 200,000 postdocs who were waiting for a position. So, which meant that we had to, you know, it's uh, 20, 20 times more, 20 people per one post. Um, that had to wait until someone was either retiring because at that point and also now with, with the corona uh, pandemic, we cannot realistically expect many new positions to be created and funded. We're talking about, you know, retrenching those positions and um, diminishing the funding. So as a result of absolutely irresponsible policies, a lot of us are being stuck at the postdoc level, like you said, Ricardo, accumulating experience, getting to absolutely stellar CVs that those who got on the tenure track 10, 15, 20 years ago, for sure, never even dreamed of having at that, at that entry level in their career, right? So with, with 150 people applying for one position uh, on the tenure track, it can only be a lottery given how people have managed to develop their CVs over the last seven. I know in, in Germany, for example, the, the average uh, number of years uh, when people get on the tenure track after obtaining their PhD diploma is seven. So after seven years, they have accumulated, you know, so many publications, so, so much activity overall. Um, that everybody's good, everybody's qualified. And in my case, for example, uh, what was really worrying and, and got me to think about my own prospects in, in the academia over the, the next few years is the fact that overnight and without actually me realizing what was going on, I seem to have transited from a situation in which I was still in the process of qualifying for a tenure track position. So I was, you know, underqualified maybe to being overqualified because of the number of years that has passed since the obtention of my PhD. And so, you know, when positions require uh, for people not to have more than four years after their PhD, and well, I have seven and I have a better CV than someone who's getting on the tenure track after four years, right? But this is the kind of constraints that the system continuously places um, so that uh, a lot of the people that are stopped at the bottleneck right now at postdoc level will have to drop out of academia simply because it's not tenable anymore, um, you know, in your early 40s when you have kids to, um, to continue with this kind of, of precarity. It is absolutely taxing um not only economically and our, on our relationships but also you know on our families and on our mental health and to which you know 
to a certain extent still continues to be a taboo this is one of the really important topics that we should also talk about you know the, the effect of precarity on mental health and what what it means to have so much to carry and so little um hope of of getting anywhere so i'll just stop here no thank you anna but i think that you made a, a great two two great points and I'm, i was gonna add just one more thing that i forgot and it is that a lot of departments of anthropology are closing or getting or are shrinking. You know, that's one. And the other one is like with the COVID-19 pandemic, there are a lot of mental issues going around and no help for academics. And also that is forcing, and I was uh, reading on Twitter last night or today morning, you know, that a lot of people are dropping out of academia because it is too much. You know, not having a regular position or a fixed position or a tenure position, then having to jump around meetings on Zoom, you know, teaching here, teaching there, and not knowing about the near future if you're going to have a job. You no, know, that's stressful and people don't need or don't want to take it. And, and I agree completely with them. You know, it's like, oh, are you, I'm going to eat next month. What I'm going to do during summer. But anyway, I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Anna. Just, I, I'd like to add a comment on the uh, mobility. I, I used to be mobile. Uh, fortunately, I may say I'm not any more precarious, but I've been precarious for eight long years. When finally I got a permanent position, well, I was really happy, but I, I couldn't believe my eyes, I might say. I'm a precarious, but on a different hand, because my permanent position is in Europe, but it's in the Indian Ocean, it's in the European outermost regions. So, uh, well, it wasn't easy at all. Mobility used to be or is an opportunity, let's say, to develop our careers, but it becomes, we might say, a prerequisite to have a permanent position. If you are not mobile, you are not good enough. Of course, we are mobile as anthropologists. We have to uh, move to our uh, field sites, but being mobile for, uh, let's say, your job as an anthropologist in academia, it's uh, compulsory. Well, you had your PhD, let's say, uh in france but you have spent uh three or four years as a postdoc in france well you're not good enough for us you have to be mobile you have to have other um experiences so uh experiencing the precarity can be different of course from one person to another it depends on the family status uh, as ricardo said well i have no f well i used let's say in the past uh, I have no family, I have no kids, I can easily move from one point to another. But what happens if you are stuck, let's say, in a place and it's your family that you cannot live there? What what can you do with your kids? Can you leave your kids at home and move for six months, for 12 months, for one year and a half? It depends also on the age uh, of the children. So it's, it's not easy. Uh, well, mm, we are doing it a job that we love we uh we would do everything to keep uh, on on being anthropologist but when something does not work we are just asking ourselves well shall i continue or not being a precarious scholar in my case as i said i've been precarious for eight long years and i said to myself i will continue for other two years let's say up to 10 years and try to do everything if not i will try to organize or use my skills as anna said well you are too qualified overqualified to have this permanent position but what shall we say shall we uh tell lies or delete things that we have on our cv in order to to have that permanent position well i don't know maybe we should find some some strategies and try to see and that's why that's the, the let's say the objective of this task force to try to see what, what happens in different countries and in which way precarity uh, uh, is lived or experienced. Uh, I said, well, I'm Romanian. Well, um, maybe things are changing a little bit, but uh, let's say seven, eight years ago, 
we had well um, i had colleagues that had my age that were not precarious in romanian had uh, permanent positions but they were saying well i have a permanent position but i'm paid my salary is 200 euros uh, a month while you are a precarious postdoc and your salary is uh, let's say 1500 euros so it was kind of well you're precarious but you have money and i'm not precarious and i have not so uh, so much money um, speaking about WC and the context, uh, in 2017-2018, the University of Western Australia, Australia hosted uh, uh, a global survey of anthropological practice. So it was meant, uh, the objective was to have, um, to compile information about anthropology as an international profession, but also to uh, focus on expertise and employment. Precarity in this survey was touched just a, just a little bit, but didn't give the opportunity, let's say, to organizer to have a global view of how precarity is lived in different countries. So um, within the, uh, the task force two weeks ago, if I'm not wrong, we had a meeting and uh, one idea, maybe Anna, you, you could add something uh, more about it, was that of uh, trying to have this uh, precarity survey to, to, to reuse or propose the same questions uh, of precarity to uh, the national associations of anthropology that are part of WCA and see how they are experiencing anthropology at the, in this particular uh, moment and also see at the level of the different generations well what uh, precarity used to be once or why some uh, people let's say are doing a lot to help to, to help the, the precarious scholars uh well i used to be a postdoc and i had a postdoc of nine months what can you do within a period of nine months you have to be on a, on the field what happens if it's a completely totally a uh, different uh, new field in a different area of the world you have to gather your data analyze your data and then practice and see what you can do in the future in which way let's say our supervisors um are are treating us or give us the time to organize the future and apply for different positions so it would be good to to see uh, if we have the possibility to run this survey at the level of WCA, in which way we can fight precarity and in which way we can propose, um, let's say, recommendations that can be used at a higher level. As Anna said, well, we are not speaking of precarity only for the anthropologist. We have uh, physicians, uh, we have uh, geographers, geographers that are precarious. And it also depends to how our discipline uh, is perceived or to the place that our uh, discipline has in the nowadays. Well, uh, what, what can we do? A lot of things, of course, we can do. But why? Uh, well, uh, let's say the um, marine biologists are getting more money than uh, than the anthropologist or why, why when you are trying to have a permanent position for instance in France for the anthropologist there are not too many places it's like okay I have a PhD I have a lot of experience I would like to continue working in the academia but there is no place for me and not only for me let's say for many other colleagues that have brilliant but really brilliant CVs and as Anna said those that are in the selections committees well, they say, well, I would really like to have a CV, uh, the, the candidate that is in front of me, because we, well, the precarious scholars, it's an endless work. It's like you, you have no idea of what is a weekend. You just work. Uh, you, you have to publish, review articles, uh, teach, trying to, to improve more and more your, um, your CV. So it would be good to, to make a point and see what can be done even at a transnational level. Thank you. Well, Yorgita, now you put things more difficult, but thank you very much for your intervention. But I was thinking about something now, that, that adding to this, uh, you know, one thing that you mentioned just at the end, like 
we were trained for academia, not for different, you know, job field. Like sometimes I am very jealous of our colleagues, you know, like those who do UX design and, you know, some things that is like, wow, you know, those who are with Epic, you know, a lot of anthropologists in businesses. But for example, most of us like, yeah, we're trained in different, in, in different fields. Well, I don't know all, all of the, your, your fields, but you know, there's different topics. We all have done field work. We have done different kind of stuff. But for example, for the private sector, we need different tools. And sometimes our training, or we were not trained like that. And also, as you mentioned, the postdoc of nine months, what are you gonna do in nine months? You no, know, you can learn how to use, you know, a slow cooker in nine, nine months, you know, great recipes, by the way. I just did it during the pandemic. But doing field work, getting into the field, you know, a new field site, you know, gaining some confidence, you know, all the it's 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 very difficult for nine for, for nine months, probably two years, but also depends on the topic. So there's a lot of things. Oh, by the way, about the WCA, well, let's do it. If you have the the questionnaire. Send it along. We'll see it. We'll send it. We translate it in different languages and voila, and let's see what happens. And of course, those who are watching or listening, they might be interested in knowing what are the questions. You know, what do you will add? You know, so that will be a lot of fun. I think know, this answering. is a, a question that has been discussed between us, executive board, uh, uh, Anna Ivasuk, that is pre control liaison. Of course, the, the idea is that of doing it, but uh, I suppose it has to, to be discussed previously and to to decide how we, we can organize it. Of course, the, uh, translating it into another language, well, I don't know, Spanish, English, I have no idea, but we have to uh, to discuss it and see how we, we can uh, organize it and uh, put it into, into practice. Of course, it's a quantitative, um survey and it would be good also to have the qualitative survey but the problem is money without money we are not doing too much i don't know if uh, s people that are attending would like to make some comments i i, I know that martin fota that uh, is the, the worked a lot for the survey would like to add something i i have no idea if he's still online or maybe other um, colleagues that are uh, attending this uh, this seminar would like to to add something else or just make comments personal experiences yeah uh, i i i would just like to uh, add some yeah to respond some comments that uh, ricardo and some things that anna georgetta said to uh, look um, for example, Ricardo mentioned the, the question of the inf infrastructure, right? If, if we could, I mean, can we talk about precarious infrastructures and uh, how they precarize our own work? Well, I would say that that, that website we cannot name where we get, where of course we don't use that website to get papers for free, of course. I, I, I do not uh, support that kind of thing, of course not. Uh, we, uh, it helped a lot. I, 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 I remember when I uh, was writing my PhD project on Indian academics in Europe, I thought, I, no way I, could, I, I can do this uh, research from Brazil. I mean, not only field work is too far, it's too expensive, but I don't have access to the literature. So for me to work on that, I, I had to go to the north, right? To work on that specific project at that point. Today, that would be different probably. I, I mean, it's not the same. I have trouble finding literature, uh, books sometimes uh, in Brazil. Uh, there, is, there are no other websites too. We, we don't use those either, of course not. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the uh, precarity of infrast infrastructure, it's not new in the South. This is an old problem, right? This has been always precarious, since ever, okay? So we are used to that. What is new is that we are precarizing people, not only buildings, right? 
um, we are making people's lives precarious, not only the work, their work conditions, but their life conditions. And I think this is a huge difference now. A difference now in Brazil, for example, this this is happening right now. Some sociology departments, not anthropology for the moment, but sociology <laughs> departments, are uh, uh, publishing calls for uh, voluntary teachers for at the undergraduate level. So, if you want to be a voluntary teacher, if you want to teach for free. You, you can apply, it's an honor, right? And this will improve your CV and everything. So, I mean, it's it's something that it's, uh, it's uh, absurd, right? And so I, I'm not sure that the problem is lack of funding, the cut of funding, but it's more about new economic and institutional models that are being bought, are being uh, adopted by people who are uh, making decisions. Uh, I, I, I know quite well the, 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 case, the case of France, for example. They just built a new, beautiful, shining campus in the outskirts of Paris for universities to be together. I'm not, I don't think that money is a problem. is 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 more about a conviction that we have to adopt new models of uh, labor at, at academic uh, the academic milieu. Um, and I think that Anna, what Anna was saying about uh, these generational uh, incomprehensions are very are very important. Of course, again, precarity is not new. And doing the history of the term is not only a some kind of exegetical exercise. It's important to understand that we are talking about something that is not new, but is not the same either. You see, uh, Elia, Norbert Elias got his permanent position when he was 50 something, okay. Uh, Gorg Gesimel. Uh, never got a, pos a, per a real permanent position. Uh, Pierre Bourdieu taught in, in, in Africa when he was young, L Bruno Latour as well, Georges Balanji as well. So we can say, you see, all, all of them uh, had precarious uh, positions at some point, etc. But again, it's not the same. Things are not the same. Uh, there is a new model, institutional, economic, uh, moral uh, economy that is, is structuring academic life. We, that is different, right? Uh, I, 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 for example, when I, when, I, when I discussed precarity with many of my interlocutors uh, who, who are now senior professors, who, who have permanent positions at well-renowned uh, universities in the US and Europe, they used to say, uh, I, I never doubt that I would have a position. I, I never doubt that. I, I knew it would be difficult the beginning for for some time but i, I knew that i would, everyone had a position in general you see in the 70s 80s 90s at some point somehow uh, or the majority of people now people they if they are lucky they get, they get one it's different right uh, and then we when we talk about mobility for example at this at this moment uh, COVID has impacted a lot precarious scholars in a very specific way. So, for example, uh, I know people from Brazilian scholars who got a postdoc in France, for example, a scholarship, and could not go they, because of COVID. So, for example, because they are, she is Brazilian, and Brazil is in a blacklist now. It's a paria in the global uh, landscape and they and she didn't get a visa to go to France 
for example, even though she has a scholarship. I know people who got a permanent position in the UK and for some bureaucratic mistake, they, uh, they, he uh, lost his permanent position for some error regarding his visa. So for, for example, uh, and we are talking about precarious uh, positions um, uh, in, a, in a broader sense, I think, when we talk about academic life and, and, and mobility. Uh, I, I, also, uh, I can also think of a, a colleague of mine who uh, finished his PhD. He got this, let, let's say, the promise of a postdoc fellowship or there would be uh, the possibility of a postdoc fellowship. And with the outbreak of COVID, the, the, the project manager, the PI, he decided to hold the scholarship, waiting for the end of the pandemics, because he cannot do proper research during the pandemics, go, go, go to the archive. Well, and wh what do people do during the pandemics? They cannot go to the archive. You see, and then we are not allowing them to have a scholarship. What kind of decision is that, right? So, uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I think there are a very more um, specific issues that will be good to discuss in, in, the, in the task force. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Vinicius. Well, yes, it's a new brave world. That's, a, that's how you say it? Yes. And that's a problem. You know, with the pandemic, a lot of people, for example, I cannot go to Europe, you know, because I'm not allowed yet, although I have my vaccines. By the way, get your vaccines. Um, but, uh, you know, each country had different, you know, or deal with the pandemic in different ways. And a lot of people who were just in the right, you know, wrong time with the pandemic they couldn't do their research so they have to find something different and that's also that part of like what were the contingencies for this kind of problem you know like you cannot say somewhere like oh great we accepted you in this super fancy you know university you know lots of money but guess what we're not gonna pay you because you're not gonna be here and so like yes because i'm not allowed nationally so there are different issues you know, and we probably we need to address them in the near future because borders are gonna open again. You no, know? well, for example, Georgetta was 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 not on the in the chat yet, but I was telling or in the Tunisia, I was telling Anna that, for example, I was in Tijuana at the beginning of this year. So, for example, the U.S.-Mexican border was not open. Not that I needed to go to the U.S., but you know, like as you mentioned, Vinicius, like. My university is on the, it was on the other side of the border, you know, University of California, San Diego. Big library, resources, you know, just using public transportation. Guess what? Now no one can use it because the border is closed. You know, well, for people walking, flying, that's another issue. But, you know, all these little things that are happening and popping right now, I think that we should address them and talk about it. And hopefully, as Georgetta mentioned, is like, put, you know, the, the the task force, the whole team, you know, with a very small, you know, amount of money, like, let's do this and figure out why, it, or to figure out new recommendations for the near future. You know, it's, things are gonna, well, from my point of view, I don't know, you know, things are gonna change in some countries about, even research, there's gonna be more money for research related, you know, like social sciences, medicine, and some of the topics will have to wait. And we understand that, of course, you know, but uh, we need to figure out some some new things that like, you know, like, well, you're not in medical anthropology. So, you know, like whatever you're doing about basketry you should wait for the next 10 years, probably. You know, that's the kind of uh, of the things that I don't like about science, for example, especially here in Mexico, you know, like no, no money has to go to the emergency, you know, instead of saying like, we have money for the emergency and we have money for the rest of us. So, well, we can continue a, a, a little chat. Well, I want to thank Carmen Real, Miriam Grossi, who are here, Martin Fota, who is also here, you know, thank you. No, greetings to Brazil. 
Well, they're in Florianopoli, so yeah. So would, would you like to add something? There's a lot of things that Jesus to address about precarity, you know, and well, we can go through the old national context, but you know, if everyone would like to add something, you know, there's a lot of people watching, and I'm very thankful for that. You know, this is, as Miriam Grossi mentioned, this is a very, very important theme, you know, in our current anthropology academy and scholarly work. So, um, please, yes. please jump in. Ricardo, since, since you mentioned recommendations, so this is something that, um, you know, the, the, uh, precarity report um, has already worked on, the authors of the precarity report have already worked on, and let me just quote from what they were um, stating in among the recommendations, and this can be found in the short version of the report as well online uh, at the link that was linked. So, first of all, a framework would be needed for career progression and tenure. Um, which would encourage receiving tenure following a certain number of teaching or research contracts, right? And employers should take on the responsibility of guaranteeing career progress inside institutions. And with that, um, what I think is uh, absolutely necessary in order to reduce the bottleneck is to transform from the number of PhD being an important indicator of excellence to the retention of PhDs. Um, as uh, on the tenure track, uh, that could be an example. Then cyclical project funding must be reduced to a minimum with a discrete budget granted to universities to develop long-standing, well-resourced research programs. We're, we were talking about infrastructures as well before, right? And to reduce overtime workloads and be aware of the risks of creating exploitative working environments. In regards to that, I would like to point out the fact that the Precanthro Collective has also been working on a draft of good practice guidelines in collaborative research, precisely in the in the framework of such um, of, of such projects, and it is very relevant also for um, for uh, the topic of precarity because it also includes an entire section about career development. Uh, and about the institutional support for such projects. And let me just link it to you, uh, Ricardo, you can link it further across the social media platforms. This is where the draft um, guidelines can be found. And they were drafted as a result of, um, of numerous uh, talks that we had among us and a, a workshop as well in which uh, different academics were talking about the, the structural conditions that are developing and crystallizing as a result of this policy of project and the projectification of research, right? Um, further, uh, among the recommendations is that governments and institutions should ensure that PhD programs have resources to provide employment contracts and salaries to all PhD students. This is not the case in all the countries. And they should be granted access to fieldwork, conference, career development funds, um, student fees and debt inducing loans should be discouraged. And finally, professional organizations and learned societies such as the ASA um, could and should increasingly engage in lobbying activities and introduce standards of good practice to be observed by institutions that adhere um, to, to such professional values. And our very good surprise uh, was also to, to notice that um, these, this draft of good practice guidelines in collaborative research was quoted um, in uh, employment in a recent employment uh, advertisement as being uh, a, a set of standards that the project in question was going to abide by. So I encourage you to disseminate these kinds of information and encourage people to to use uh, what has already been done and and to sort of build um built on on what has been done already in terms of recommendations and of course this is for the european context but it can be you know modulated and and scaled up to other contexts as well georgetta do you do, do you want to you you just posted something on chat do you want to talk about that Yes, thank you so much. Just uh, to add something more uh, for those that uh, are online or if you, when you have some time, just click on the focal blog and you can find a debate on the precarity report. Of course, there's a precarity report. 
uh, if I just read quickly the contents of Stefan Voiku precarity report, reflections, critique and extensions, uh, don't call uh, anthropological lives matter, except they don't. Natalia Buyer, what sample, whose voice and which Europe? Giacomo Lo Perfido on excellence, precarity, and to what use we put on our we put our money. Susanna Narotsky, a history of precariousness in Spain. Ella Drachkevich, blinded by the light, international precariety in academia the moral economy of precarity. So there are those are some comments on the margins of the precarity report. And uh, I do agree that the recommendations that Anna has just uh, mentioned should, should be shared and also uh, taken into, um, into consideration. Uh, so of course, once again, the precarity report concerns only uh, the Europe. So anthropologists in Europe and uh, I suppose most of the character salient characteristics of the precarity report results can be um, seen in uh, other countries, so in different regional uh, uh, contexts. So when you have some time, just uh, have a look at the focal blog and read the entire precarity report or the, the short version of the, of the report. Thank you, Georgetta. No worries. We're going to publish all of this. You know, we're going to publish, post, it's not publish. We're going to post the, the report. We're going to post the guidelines and we're going to post the focal blog. So just give me some time when we finish, you know, to settle up all the things. And everyone who is listening, you know, you will be able to, you know, see all the links, all the information on the Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram of the World Anthropological Union, the International Union of Ethnological and Anthropological Sciences, and the World and the World Council of Anthropological Associations. So we got that covered, and I'm gonna add something from Mexico in all these posts. That is one of the things that we have closer. Well, at least for me, you know, something in Spanish. So about the reality on this side of the Atlantic. Yes, the Atlantic. So anyway. Um, um, I think that we need to, oh, we have two comments. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Olive CLX, okay, he, uh, on Twitter. In line with the discussion, here is a political program for scientific refoundation in France. Okay, I'm gonna try to find that out rogue ESR because I cannot see it from here. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, thank you. And we have Lia Ferrero, hello. Hola, Lia. Uh, Lia says hello to everyone. You know, the president of the Latin American Association, you know, joining us on Facebook. Um, well, that reminds me also that uh, the Latin American Association, she's, they are very vocal about, you know, like the epistemic ext um, extractivism also. Now the ABBA, uh, you know, mentioned it and some other journals mention it, you know, specifically about that. That also is one of the causes of precarity. But anyway, that we can discuss later. So. We can continue discussing. I am very grateful and I'm actually very excited to have this conversation, you know, with everyone, you know, especially, specifically because all of these conversations uh, give us a uh, new idea on how to work and how to, you know, orient or to see different things that we haven't seen. So I, I wouldn't be worried about that. The, the good thing is that we can we can use some of that information, you know, to, to keep working on, on, on our own countries. So um, probably we can have some final remarks if you want. Who wants to go first? I can go first. Um, I think one of the most important things is really to amplify our voices. 
I mean, um, you know, and, and to network among us to sort of unify all the initiatives that are being taken in different contexts. And thanks to uh, Olive CLX for, for posting um, the political program for a scientific refoundation in France. It is in French and it would be very, very um, useful to sort of, you know, to, to translate such initiatives and to network among us so that we can have more power and multiply the discussions at national level and then at supranational level. I think that this is the one thing that, um, that I would really emphasize as, um, as a closing remark. I'm the following one, of course, amplify our voices, as Anna said, but also try to think in terms of responsibilities, of shared responsibilities in order to to fight precarity and, uh, well, let's find a solution, even if it's very, very difficult to, to speak in terms of solutions. There are some recommendations that uh, have been already cited. And the idea is that of um, collaborating between the different anthropological associations. And um, why not start uh, before, well, let's say, the um, uh, proposing the, the EASA survey in a uh, global level, let's say, uh, start with experiences, personal experiences in different contexts and see. What's happening? Well, how precarity is seen or lived in Japan, or I don't know, in in Spain, in uh, in Mexico. I don't know. So let's see uh, what uh, how precarity is seen. What measures can be taken, and uh, what can be uh, done further. So let, let's join our forces and uh, try to to do something. Yeah, uh, I agree with you, Jutta. Uh, the, the question is uh, to uh, discuss, discuss what we can do concretely, uh, given that we are talking about uh, global phenomenon and not only in anthropology. And it's a, it's a, a, a big question for um, universities at, at large. But I, I do think that we can um, we can. Um, not only address, uh, discuss uh, precarity in a more, in a less obvious way. Uh, let's say, uh, defetishizing, we have to defetishize some narratives that are uh, pervasive at this moment, because we, we, we mentioned them. Uh, well, we are all cosmopolitan people, we should love to be traveling a lot and going from one place to another. How come we are? We don't love to spend 10 years of our lives uh, going from one place to another? These are very common ideas in, in um, amongst our colleagues, right? Uh, so we have to address this uh, naturalized discourses, but we have to think about practices too, and it's, it's possible too to discuss at institutional level. And uh, I think that the, the global survey is a good uh, start. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and I, I, would, I, I would like to invite those who are watching us, who would like to join forces with us to write. And uh, if yeah, more people would be interested in, in participating in the task force, I, I think it, it's, it would be good to have more people interested, right? Thank you, Vinicius. Yes, we need to add more people to the discussion. So please join in. You know, the good thing, well, one of the good things about all these new virtual conferences is that they're cheaper sometimes and that we can, you know, get together, you know, at some point. I know that we are tired <laughs> of Zoom classes and God knows what else, but you know this has been an opportunity, to, an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to you know know a lot of people, you know, without the uh, you know the being there in the conferences. So hopefully the 
Next, congresses, conferences, and seminars will be hybrid, allowing people to join in from different parts of the world. Well, I would like to thank Anna, Georgetta, and Vinicius for you know, bringing this well, urgent and very important topic to, uh, to our pre-Congress conversations. I would like to make a couple of announcements before saying goodbye. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that the call for papers for all the thematic panels of the U.S. Congress, Yucatan, that is going to be virtual, but we call it Yucatan because originally it was going to be there in Yucatan and we were going to have wonderful food and going to beautiful places, but, well, the pandemic. So... June 30 is the deadline of the papers. So there's a lot of thematic panels, a lot of topics, you know, like I was just reading here on Slack that our dear colleague Lucy Hunt just posted something about like a visual methods um, panel. So join in. The conversation is there in social media, you know, um, it will be great. So. Those are the thematic panels and well, we will have the results soon. And also there's more surprises to come. And also just to, re uh, to remind everyone who's listening or viewing us is that there's also be some kind of uh, grants, you know, for different or specific topics for people helping them, you know, like uh, I think the, it's the internet or the fees for the Congress or um, something else. I think it is for, for moms to, you know, get some help with childcare. So I don't have the details yet, but soon we will publish them. Well, this is, has been a great thing. Please, uh, Anna, Vinicius, George, stay with me a little longer. You know, I'm just gonna say goodbye to the wonderful people who has been following us. You know, like, thank you. You know, these videos are being transmitted uh, through the US Congress social media, but we also would like acknowledge and thank you know the WCAA because they're which was meeting in the social media uh, Colegio de Tólogos y Antropólogos Sociales in Mexico and the Latin American Association Asociación Latinoamericana de Antropología that allow us to transmit in all different channels you know so everyone can hear and you know and play or review all these recording well thank you everyone have a great Wednesday, I was going to say Tuesday, have a great Wednesday and hopefully see everyone on the U.S. Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot for organizing this. And one last thing, Olive CLX, if you can get, get in touch with me. Um, I can't find you at any, on any platform. So, you know, look me up on Twitter and, and let's network on this. Great idea. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you, Carmen.